Bonjour, habari za leo. My name is Kevin Mutia. Solofina Nekesa. Lauren Arnza. Ryan Fisher, professional officer at Ikle Africa. On behalf of Ikle Africa, the African Center for Cities, our future cities and partners, I'm excited to welcome all of you to the Rise Africa 2021 Action Festival. Rise Africa has been growing as a platform of thinkers, doers, enablers, committed to inspiring action for sustainable cities. Rise Africa is about building active networks across academia, government, private sector, civil society, and the arts. Our entry point is based not on, on articulating problems followed by proposing solutions, but rather on celebrating our cities as places of innovation and culture, while asking what more we can do to make them sustainable, inclusive, and vibrant. This festival is hosting 46 sessions over five days from across 16 countries in Africa and the world. Every session aims to share new ideas, showcase ongoing actions, and launch new initiatives by bringing participants together to chart a new route forward. We hope that the festival program will inspire you to commit to one or more specific actions that you or your organizations will take on. As this session closes, you will be redirected to a survey in which you can articulate these actions. We will follow up on this committed action throughout the year and offer resources, connections, and support. In this way, we are testing the idea that events can galvanize action, and we hope that you will join us in this effort. Beyond this session, there are many ways to take part in the festival. Register for further sessions. Vote for your favorites in the photo competition. Test your knowledge of African cities from our daily quiz. Watch a variety of inspiring video provocations. And listen and dance to the Rise Africa 2021 playlist. We hope that you will make all attempts to reach out to new people and build lasting connections. Before we begin, it's important to note that this session is being recorded and that by participating, you are consenting to be recorded. All recordings will be available on the program page after the festival. Creative expression is vital for creating new futures for our cities. So we invite you to enter this session in the spirit of creativity and dreaming. When inspired fires fly, we are moving into the city again this morning. Our dreams tucked under our arms and the bags under our eyes overflowing with hope. We are moving the city again out of mourning, cleaning our streams of consciousness with floodlight ideas to illuminate the workings of our inner scope. We've masked our intentions anew. We've strengthened our bones, calcified our resilience, and merged stillness with our minds using breath as the sinew. We continue to forge a dreamscape across an arid land held hostage by reality. We are watering smiles into the cracks in the concrete. Reinventing laughter to sprout and fill the lulls in our conversations, yes, our windows open towards brick walls, but our eyes are the source of sunlight. We are living temples of light, moving across the cityscapes, mobile street lamps, the reflection of the heavens we rose from. to today's session. Uh, my name is Rose and I'm happy to see all of you all on online and your lovely faces. It would be great to have your faces being seen here. Uh, you're welcome to today's session, the role of higher education, the transition to a circular economy as part of the Rise Africa 2021 Action Festival. As I said, my name is Rose and I work with the learning team from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And yeah, so let's dive in into the whole discussion, feel at home. I'm sure this is going to be educative. This session is going to be fun. Take the opportunity to meet new people. And uh, so today I'm joined by uh, colleagues from the African Leadership University and my colleague Rene Rednell from uh, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Our, our, I'm joined by Rudy from the African Leadership University, uh, Lynette from a student at the African Leadership University. Um, and uh, as we had already uh, people who had come earlier, 
uh, feel free to uh, introduce yourself in the chat box and uh, where you're best and, uh, and where you are, who you are. Um, I'm sure uh, we're going to have a very successful event. Our, so uh, today's session, uh, we're going to hear from, uh, we're going to hear about the introduction to circular economy. Uh, we're going to look at how circular economy can be applied in the African continent. We're going to hear also why is it important? Uh, why is circular economy really important, especially in the African narratives in the African context? You know, circular economy has become such a big part of our uh, of the global discussions and we don't want to be left behind in our continent and in our cities and in our nations and in Africa. We are also going to hear how the African Leadership University, we're going to hear where is the African Leadership University best and what are they doing in the space of circular economy and what are their ambitions. And I'm hoping we're also going to have, uh, we're, going, we're actually going to have breakout sessions where we get to know each other, get to know where our, our di different people online, what they're doing in their universities and wherever they are best and share knowledge or uh, make sure that before you leave this event, at least you, you, you know one or two people that you didn't know. And I think our, that will stick in our, our minds and make networks, could be professional, could be our, personal and um, yeah, so with that, um, I'm going to invite Renera Edna, who's going to take us through the introduction to circular economy and have fun and uh, enjoy the session. Welcome Renera, who is the lead, the education, the higher education lead at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Over to you Renera. Thank you so much, Rose. Um, it's lovely to see so many familiar and unfamiliar faces on the screen today and looking forward to getting to know all of you. Now, before I start um, in terms of an introduction to the circular economy and who we are as the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, I always like to find out what people in the audience know about the circular economy. Um, so, <clears throat> sorry, fingers over your keyboards, <clears throat> open your chat box, and on a scale of one to five, rate your knowledge of the circular economy. One, you know nothing, and five, you know more than me and Rose and Rudy and Lynette. So rate yourself and go. Oh, good. A couple of threes coming through. A two and a half. Good. Two, four. Right. Three. Excellent. Good stuff. Okay, great. So we've got a really quite a good knowledge of the circular economy um, in the room, in the Zoom today. So hopefully um, what I'm going to be talking to you about this morning is a bit of a refresh and just an opportunity to make sure that we're all on the same page and that we're all talking about circular economy in the same kind of framing. So hopefully you don't get too bored. We've got some great case studies to share with you. Um, but I am going to attempt to be technology wise and uh, share my screen, which I've proved to be pretty useless at earlier today. Uh, bear with me a second. Right, I am hoping that everybody can see my uh, screen. Rudy's nodding. Yes. Excellent. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Rudy. <laughs> okay, so to kick off, just in case you don't know who we are as the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Um, so in short, we are a charitable foundation based in the United Kingdom, but we do have offices uh, in various other countries around the world. And basically, we've been around for 10 years and we do three things. We develop and promote the idea of the circular economy. We engage and inspire key actors such as yourselves in the system. And we mobilize systems solutions at scale. And in order to do this, uh, we work in kind of three with three different groups. So if you want to change the economy, clearly business and industry is absolutely key to that. And so we make sure that we work with industrial leaders and business leaders from around the world. And some of our strategic partners are some of the world's biggest industries, the Coca-Colas, the Unilevers, the Danons, the Philips. Um, and we work with them to try and help their industries and their organizations shift towards a circular economy. But if industry is going to change, it can only do it within the confines of legislation and policy within the countries in which it sits. And so another strand of our work is to do a lot with cities and governments and institutions all around the world to help reshape policy and legislation to enable the transition to a circular economy to happen at scale. But we can't do any of this if we don't have a workforce that is trained and has the knowledge and the skills to be able to apply the circular economy at scale. And so for the last 10 years, we've worked um, alongside academia to make sure that not only the, the current workforce in terms of kind of professional training, but future generations in the future workforce has, this, has the knowledge and skills and competencies to be able to apply the circular economy. 
Um, we also work uh, at a systems level rather than consumer behavior change. So we work along a number of material flows and their associated systems. We're probably best known for our work in plastics with the new plastics economy, but we also work in food, fashion, finance, and we do some work in the built environment. We are also for uh, later in 2021, we will be writing a white paper on the links between the circular economy and biodiversity and climate change. So watch out for those. It's kind of a growing area of conversation. So everything that we do is underpinned by kind of robust evidence and analysis. We have a fantastic communications program, but really we are out there to develop and promote this idea of the circular economy and to engage players such as yourself in helping this global transformation at scale. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of start the journey of the circular economy with a bit of a story. And I'm gonna take you back to December, 1924. Specifically, we're in Geneva uh, on the 23rd of December, 1924. And all around the city of Geneva, you can imagine the snow is all over the place and it's freezing cold. Christmas lights are being strung up and the city is really sparkling as people are doing their last minute shopping. But this date is important because on this date, there was a meeting. And this meeting brought together representatives from the world's leading light bulb manufacturers, people from Philips, from Osram, General Electric, and all the light bulb manufacturers. And they came together because they had a problem. They weren't selling enough light bulbs. The reason they weren't selling enough light bulbs is that because light bulbs were lasting too long and customers therefore didn't need to buy new ones. So as a group known as the Phoebus Cartel, they made a collective decision to save their industry and drive up sales they agreed to limit the lifespan of light bulbs to a thousand hours, which, is, which was significantly below what they were capable of, of last, how long they were capable of lasting. And so today, many people consider that <clears throat> the first case of planned obsolesc obsolescence, the intentional reduction of a lifespan to increase sales. And importantly, that decision was the result of and fueled by an economic system built on repetitive consumption and the foundation of our modern economy. This economy, we all know, exploded during the Industrial Revolution, labor and energy were cheap, and we had seemingly endless supply of raw materials. We developed processes to make things cheaper and faster and methods to make consumers like us demand more. We wanted things new and we wanted them, we wanted them cheaper. We created an economy that is linear, and this system dominates today's economy, which you all know, as you've all told me that you have a, a really good understanding of uh, the circular economy. And so to sell more stuff and keep the economy growing, we've had to take more resources from the ground. We've had to make that into all sorts of different fantastic products that we all want. And when it's no longer needed, as we know, it is disposed of. So this is what we call the linear economy, our take, make, waste economy. And we also know that this model no longer works. We know that we're destroying our natural environment. We know that this economy is incredibly wasteful. For example, in Europe, the average car spends 92% of its life parked. So it's only used for 8% of its time, which is, which is ridiculous. And importantly, it is also financially really wasteful. So in 2013, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation calculated that around 85% of the fast moving consumer goods that were made ended up in either landfill or incineration. 2.7 trillion dollars just literally going in the bin and so we need a different system and if we need that dis different system what does that system look like let's go back to light bulbs let's fast forward almost 100 years when the architect thomas rao was redesigning skiffle airport rao went to phillips so phillips was one of the phoebus cartel that i was talking about earlier and said he wanted to buy lights he wasn't interested in how phillips delivered it but he only wanted to pay for light. And so through this partnership, Philips Signify was developed. Philips owned the entire lighting infrastructure in Schiphol Airport, and all the airport does is rent the light. So this means Philips has moved from a model where they were driving down the, the, the ability for a product to last a long time to one where it's in their best interest to ensure the bulbs last as long as possible. The system is really easy to fix. The components can be taken apart and remanufactured to be able to make new bulbs and new parts of the system and to drive costs down. This is an incredibly good example of the circular economy in action. And it's not just in Schiphol Airport this is happening. Uh, so in London, for example, the National Union of Students relating to higher education also only rent their light in the office in London. 
So what is the circular economy? So essentially, it's a new way of making and using goods and services that uses materials rather than uses them up. It's an economy. If you listen to Ellen in any of her TED Talks, she talks about an economy that works in the long term. And, she talk, and we talk about three different principles that underpin the circular economy. We talk about an economy that is driven up by design, powered by renewable energy. In the system, waste and pollution are eliminated. Products and materials are kept in use. And not, we don't just do less bad to nature, but we really regenerate it, we build it up. We put back more than we take out. Again, it's a system that works in the long term. So it's always useful to go back and have a look at some examples of this in practice. So the first principle to eliminate waste and pollution I mean, we can design our goods and services differently. We can do it in a way that stops waste from being produced in the first place. We know that around 80% of the environmental impact of a product is determined at the design phase. So we need to think of design and pollution as a design of waste and pollution as a design flaw and think about how we can design these flaws out. And we found a really great example from the African continent in Jibu. So Jibu is a, a franchised organization and it operates in seven countries across the, across the continent. But here, Jibu has found a way of not only bringing safe drinking water into um, rural uh, communities, but has done it in a way that has designed out the need for single use plastic bottles and therefore has designed out the waste that comes along with using single waste, single use plastic bottles. So Jibu provides water in large refillable containers and encourages its consumers to use refillable bottles. So a fantastic example of designing out waste through a new operating model. So the second principle of the circular economy is about keeping products and services, uh, products and materials in use, such as we talked about in the case of Philips Lighting. So this principle is really all about how we change our business models that promote reuse, that promote remanufacture, that are utilizing materials over and over again. We talk about the sharing econ economy, we talk about refurbishment, better quality and longer lasting products. We talk about reverse logistics, material banks, and knowing where your material assets are, how you can recover them and how you can reuse them. We think very differently about assets and material ownership. And my example of this one today comes from South Africa with the Western Cape Industrial Symbiosis Program. So this is a great example of how a systems-wide approach to material flows across the city of, uh, of Cape Town match up waste materials from one company to another company that needs those materials as feedstock. So in this way, waste materials are kept circulating in the system and value is created from what would previously have ended up in landfill or incineration. So the third principle of the circular economy about regenerating natural systems. We, all, we often talk about the fact that in nature, there is literally no such thing as waste. Natural systems form perfect loops and what's waste for one thing is food for another. So the excess fruit that falls from a tree decomposes and helps fertilize the soil. And we often talk a lot about, uh, as I said earlier, at how we can do less bad to our environment. And in a circular economy, we really talk about how we can do better, how we can give back more. Not just less bad, but rebuild and regenerate our natural environment. So AgriProtein, again, is a, is a South African uh, company. And in this example, black soldier fly larvae are used to convert organic waste into a high quality protein feed for livestock. So that improves the quality of the feed that livestock are getting. But importantly, the byproduct is a nutrient rich compost, which goes back into fertilizing the soil. So this process not only reduces the need for land and water for um, uh, creating crops for, for, for livestock farming, but helps return nutrients and build up the soil. So there we have it, a really quick canter through the basic uh, principles of the circular economy, but I know that that's probably all, you, you know all of that. Um, but I would like to reiterate, it's an economic opportunity first and foremost, but it has hugely beneficial spin-offs for both the environment and our finite resources. But actually, today's session is really looking around why it is so important that the higher education sector picks up this framework and looking at the role that higher education can play in the transition to a more circular economy. Uh, so this is, I couldn't resist a beautiful picture of my old university, UCT, unfortunately, the Jagger Library there on uh, the left-hand side doesn't look quite as pretty at the moment because it was ravaged by fires not so long ago, um, but it is a beautiful campus. 
And, uh, you know, in the way that we talk about uh, the role that higher education plays in this is that it is fundamental and that there are five ways in which higher education really drive or can drive the transition to a circular economy. So the first one of those, and I mentioned earlier about skills and knowledge, is in teaching. So how are you teaching the principles of the circular economy and how are you infusing circular economy knowledge and skills through your current courses or through new courses that are being developed? The second way that we think you are instrumental is in research, the research that you do both to advance the concept of the circular economy, but also to be able to support the application of the circular economy. And through our work with global universities and global businesses, we've seen a number of, of, of fantastic projects that have come out where universities have been working with business to be able to do the research to underpin the way that circular economy is applied within their industry. The third area that is um, of increasing importance actually is around campus management. So not only how we teach the students and the experience that they have, but it's no point in teaching them some stuff in the classroom. And then they walk out into the canteen and there's single use plastic everywhere. And actually the university is not allowing those students to experience um, what living and breathing in a circular economy might, might look like. You know, uh, universities have huge purchasing power and often take up big landmass within cities. And so we're now starting to have conversations with universities around how are you using that purchasing power? How are you using yourself as a lighthouse demonstrator of how the rest of the city and other organizations could become more circular? Another area that's become increasingly important over the last couple of years is we've seen a real rise in student-led activity. Uh, this has been really interesting over the last four years in America where national government has really not allowed universities to be teaching this kind of, uh, kind of information. And students have just gone, well, hang on a second, we kind of still want to do stuff in this space. And so we've seen a real rise of student-led groups. We've got in, the, in, in Europe, you've got the Circular Economy Club, which was started by students. In America, you've got the Post Landfill Action Network started by students. And all around the world, we're seeing some, some really great student clubs and societies open up um, and really further the transition to a circular economy. And the fifth area is really all about uh, leadership and influence in recognizing that higher education institutions are often really influential in local settings or indeed on a global stage. And how can we influence these academic leaders to use the knowledge of a circular economy to promote the transition that we all know that we need? So why is Ellen MacArthur Foundation, uh, you know, having this conversation and what have we done to date? Well, you can see on the screen some of the things that we, uh, we do. We have supported academic research. We have provided expert insight. We have built a global network of uh, higher education institutions engaged in circular economy and really looking forward to getting to know the African universities a bit more and bringing them alongside and into that network as well. We create resources, so we have a really good suite of resources for academics to pick up to help them build courses. Uh, and we have an enormous amount of content on our website that is available for use. So again, some of the things, some of the universities that we've been working with over the years and looking at how and where circular economy belongs in the curriculum. And then last year, we also developed a fantastic online learning program for postgraduates and early career professionals. And over the last 12 months, we've had over 20,000 people that have registered and gone through a version of our From Linear to Circular or Inside the Circular Economy program. There is significant appetite for this content and we see that growing uh, at a global level. We've been engaged, as I said, in a huge amount of research and, levering in, and supporting levering in significant research funds to support the development of a circular economy. Um, most recently in the United Kingdom, and I'm kind of actively engaged in that, and there are real opportunities for global, for global universities to engage. But the, the UK has put um, 30 million pounds into a fund to develop five circular economy centers of excellence and a coordination hub in recognizing the interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary nature. Of, uh, of, of the circular economy. And as I said, over, over the last um, two years, we've significantly ramped up our work to support universities in implementing circular economy principles in the way they manage their campus and campus activities. We currently work with uh, leading uni uh, United States universities on a peer learning program. We've developed a circular economy procurement framework and um, you know, really looking at how circular economy plays a role in addressing scope three emissions and driving down a university's um, carbon footprint 
So that's kind of all I suppose I wanted to say, just a brief introduction on um, what it is that we do um, and why it is that we think universities are so important in this agenda. But one of the things that we're really keen on in today's session is for you to network, to meet each other, uh, and for us to get to know you a little bit. And so we are going to break out into breakout rooms, and there's going to be four or five of you in a breakout room. So it'll be cameras on and getting to know each other. And we'd like you to do a couple of things. One, introduce yourselves, who you are, where you're from, and importantly, what is your interest in this agenda? So why, why are you here today? What, what has brought you to my little, you know, our little screens, uh, and what is your engagement with higher education and the circular economy? And we're going to have, uh, I think it's about 15 minutes to have those conversations so you can start to get to know each other. But here's the key, you kind of have to remember or write it down, because when we come back, we're going to get everybody to share one person's reason, not your own, for being here. So uh, you'll need to kind of concentrate and remember what people are saying. So I'm hoping that Freya has got the breakout rooms all ready and that with the magic touch of a button, you will head off to join a breakout room. So we'll see you back in 15 minutes. So Jenny. We'll just wait for everybody to come back. Hope everybody got to meet somebody interesting and uh, have a bit of a chat around why you're here. Some nodding faces. A little bit. Yes, no. Yes, it was very helpful. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. Somebody's out there. <laughs> Sorry, I, I know how it feels to be talking to a screen and like no one's really answering. It's very disconcerting. But yes, I think it was quite interesting that we had like, I think, five participants in our room. Um, two from the same, from the same, well, almost the same cities, very close to each other. That was myself and another lady called Helen. So I think we might connect here after because I think we're doing we're sort of driving towards the same goal. So that's awesome. Great stuff. OK, I think most people are back. So building on from what you've just said, what I'd like everybody to do is go back to their chat box and put one person's name that you met in your group into the chat box with a sentence on why they are here today. Um, I think from our perspective, it's really interesting to hear why people are here. Um, and we don't have the time today to hear back from everybody. But if you can put one person's name and a sentence on why they are here today. And um, as soon as you're ready, hit enter. And we should see some really great stuff coming up in the chat. Oh, here to be the change. Love that. Go Barry. MBA students, pivot to creative agency, continue learning. Who else? Brilliant. In-depth knowledge about circular economy. Well, hopefully my very brief introduction um, put you on the right path and you can follow up afterwards. Nexus of energy, water and food. That's very specific. Mm -hmm. Great. Somebody's here looking at circular economy in Maputo. This is fantastic. Well, it's really great to see why everybody is here today. So keep those coming in, um, but we're going to crack on and I'm going to hand back over to Rose because which Rose is going to talk a little bit more around the work that the Ellen MacArthur Foundation um, has been funded to undertake um, in Africa over the next two years. And then Rose is going to introduce our colleagues from the African Leadership University. So Rose, I will get your get the slides up and hand over to you. Yes, thank you so much, Renera, and thanks everyone uh, for the progress so far. Great to see all these ambitions and people uh, with great ambitions coming through in the chat box. And I hope you had fun in the breakout sessions and uh, you're enjoying the session so far. Feel free to let me know uh, <laughs> if you're not enjoying and we see how to get on that. Uh, yeah, so uh, as we've heard from Renera, 
there's uh, a lot of opportunities, there's a lot of recognition on why circular economy is important, especially in this era where uh, we're looking at sustainable development, where we're looking at climate action with different challenges uh, that are facing uh, the, the world globally, but also are in, in Africa as Africans, uh, how do we uh, take up circular economy? How, how, how important is it? And especially when we relate to higher education, Renera has mentioned how, how higher education is really important in driving circular economy. So as uh, the uh, Elon MacArthur Foundation, we, we have a project that we're working on in the African continent. And as I mentioned at the start, those who missed uh, this project is we're working with, collaborating with the uh, ALU, which we shall hear from uh, Rudy about, and uh, it's the African Leadership University. And it's funded by the Mava Foundation and the, really, this project is about delivering a profound and lasting understanding of circular economy. And uh, as we already saw, we, when you look at the activities that are in this project, really match with what Renera has already discussed. We look towards training the African Leadership University staff on how to infuse circular economy in teaching. If you could remember what Renera talks about in teaching, in campus management, in student activities, in leadership, and in research. But we're also looking at um, developing bespoke programs, learning programs online, and some will be face-to-face. -face. Uh, the One of the online programs is called the Inside the Circular Economy. At the end of the presentation, we are going to share links how we can get more in touch with you if you want to uh, get more engaged in these programs. And our, But we're also looking at developing or, or supporting the development of a community of African uh, universities that are doing great work in circular economy and have these big ambitions. So, so far we, we have the African Leadership University, the INSCAP Institute, Stellenbosch University that are profiled on our website. And this profiling shows the stories of what they're doing and what their ambitions are. And uh, so if you're there and you have a university and you'd like to get in touch, you're going to leave your contacts with us. As I said, we're going to share the link we could explore how to uh, to engage more and see how you could share your stories and also work, get more ambitious and work on and lead, take leadership in circular economy on the African continent and drive a transition, train young leaders and, and train these uh, the youth who are the leaders of, of our, in our continent. And um, as I already mentioned, the Inside the Circular Economy program is going to take place on the, from the 4th of October to the 19th of November. It is really for professionals and postgraduate students, specifically on the African continent, because as you've seen, most of the circular economy uh, uh, opportunities are more in, in Europe, in the US, but now it's time for us to take lead uh, of our own, uh, our own narratives in Africa and also drive our own uh, uh, circular development in cities and towns and urban areas and everywhere. Um, but also we're not only, uh, we're not leaving anyone behind. We have a program for the teenagers and uh, we have uh, the Africa Teen Webinar Series. It will be really to inspire the young generation to take up careers in, in circular economy and also be our take up because we have innovative young minds. And if you have a young mind that is already uh, changed in, from, from their, the way they handle things, the way they from teaching specifically, because the teachers and the, the universities have a great role to play in uh, modeling what they, the, the labor force, the workforce will be and what the students, the courses the students take up. So we'll be inspiring them. But also we have an incoming uh, summit 21 that is organized by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And um, if our website is very, very rich, we shall also share at the end of the, the, the presentation, uh, and you could register and you're going to meet so many people globally from everywhere. And the good thing is that with circular economy, you can learn from anyone and, and but also pick up lessons that apply to the context where you are. And um, so that, that puts me to our uh, uh, next slide, please. So that, that takes me to our welcoming Rudy, 
who is a faculty at the African Leadership University and is very, very influential in our driving cycle economy in higher education at the African Leadership University. Uh, really, Akman, over to you. Thanks, Rose. Hi, can everyone hear me fine? Okay, great. Um, cool. Thank you. Um, it's really nice being here. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, I actually um, met quite a few of people in the um, in this chat today and in the Zoom room uh, before, so it's really nice seeing friendly faces um, in the list of attendees. Um, so I want to talk today a little bit about just what ALU is doing. Um, and uh, specifically, I want to start with this quote. It is in Pigeon, um, and it says, because native doctor travel go London, no means say the gods go big and speak English. Um, and uh, as all of you know, you all know exactly what it means, right? It's very clear. <laughs> so um, I think this, this idiom uh, basically means that times change and the environment changes, but um, uh, there are some things that stay the same. So people might begin speaking English, but the gods will still speak the same language. Um, so there are some things that remain constant. And for me, this is um, a, a good way to approach the circular economy because um, if we look at, as Renera spoke in the beginning of the session, um, the, the linear system basically just emerged in the Industrial Revolution. And with colonialism, that was um, put into um, the African context. But before that, circular economy existed. Um, and most likely it will exist long afterwards as well. And so I, I think every time we talk about the circular economy, um, I get a student or someone in the audience saying, oh, this circular economy, this is what my grandparents did in the village. Um, because circular economy in many ways is, is natural. It's, it's a normal way of being. So I think the, um, I saw some of the comments there of people being interested to know um, what the circular economy looks like within the African context. And I think a big portion of that is to relearn the language of the gods, so to speak, um, to say, what are some of the things that we have always been doing um, and how can we phrase it in a way that, um, and understand it in a way that we see the long-term um, regenerative impact thereof. So I'm going to share some of the things that we as ALU are doing, but um, it's not at all innovative. <laughs> it's not at all um, uh, uh, new. And many of you guys are already doing this and better. So, um, but I do believe that there's a power in sharing stories uh, because if we share stories, we can create a narrative together um, that shows the amazing things that are happening all across the continent. So for those who don't know ALU, let me just quickly introduce to you who is the African Leadership University. Um, we are a university fairly recently established um, uh, and we have two campuses in Mauritius and Rwanda and uh, some satellite campuses scattered all over um, Africa. Uh, but we are a project-based, student-driven and mission-oriented um, university. So what that means is that our students come to ALU and they don't declare uh, a major, they instead declare a mission. And then based on that mission, they, we equip them and we support them to, with the right skills and the right knowledge in order to achieve that mission um, after university. So a big portion of the time that students are at ALU, they're actually not in a classroom. They are interning um, at institutions or running their own businesses or designing projects um, that they actually run while, while they're in university. So it's a very um, uh, applied sort of uh, learning experience. Um, we uh, were founded with the vision of um, uh, contributing to the development of the African continent by building leaders. And this is a very big um, uh, belief that we at, as ALU have, is that the power of creating innovative leaders. If you have a good leader in place, they can do massive difference. Um, and if you have a bad leader in place, they can do massive harm. And so building good leaders that can help us establish good institutions in African countries, that is an excellent way for us to develop the country in whatever um, challenge uh, presents itself on the continent. And this kind of takes us to one of the other uh, important things that we um, at, at ALU value. And this is these challenges and these opportunities. So on the left-hand side, you'll see the, there are several what we call grand challenges and on the right hand side grand opportunities so we try to uh, push our students towards these opportunities and these challenges because we believe that these are the biggest um, uh, places where the african continent can really make a difference in the next few um, uh, decades and um, these are loosely aligned, uh, aligned with the united nations sustainable development goals 
But if you look at them, you'll notice that circular economy is a golden thread that runs through almost all of them. We cannot do urbanization in the same way that Europe did it. We need to do it in better ways. We need to do it more circular. So the circular economy presents really amazing opportunities for us to approach this challenge of urbanization, of climate change, of governance, job creation and infrastructure. The way we design our infrastructure needs to be different fundamentally from the way that the developed world um, did their infrastructure. We cannot make the same mistakes. There just isn't enough planet left for us to make the same mistakes as Europe did. Um, and so uh, the same thing with uh, when it comes to these opportunities. Um, there are so many amazing ways that we can uh, build Africa and develop Africa. Um, and the circular economy is something that is embedded in all of those different areas. So that's really something that we try to push at ALU. And um, today I just want to talk a little bit about some of the operational ways that we're doing that. Uh, because I realize that everyone on this call is, of course, uh, not everyone, but most people here are at the forefront pioneers of circular economy um, and uh, I can't pretend to know more than all of you but I do know what ALU does operationally um, so let's talk about this because I think it's a really interesting um, thing for all of us to share stories on. Um, so we have some small nudges and this nudges, um, these nudges are, uh, are things that we learned especially from university campuses in Europe. Um, things like push taps. Instead of having a screw top tap, you push a button and water comes out and then it stops automatically after a few seconds. And this dramatically reduces water consumption. We also have reusable cutlery in our canteen. So if you buy a burger at the local canteen um, on campus, you don't get it in a takeaway container by default. You get it in a washable plate by default and you can pay extra. Um, for a takeaway container. But the result is that students less, uh, make much less waste. Um, we also have water fountains to, like this one on the left hand side, to just visually push people to bring bottles to campus instead of bringing, uh, uh, buying plastic bottles, um, but rather bring their own reusable water bottles. In terms of our actual campus design, um, we were incredibly fortunate to only recently design and build our campus. The place that I'm sitting on was built last year. Um, and so this is um, very, we were able to incorporate a lot of really amazing circular economy things. For example, we have modular classrooms. So we don't have any fixed furniture in the classrooms. And that means that we don't waste a lot of space. Um, we, we are able to repurpose classrooms all the time for depending on different things. We don't have big auditoriums that are sitting empty 90% of the time, uh, but we have through fairs, walkthroughs um, uh, that normally students just walk through. But if we have a very big event, we can easily repurpose that space and turn it into an auditorium. The result is we can actually accommodate a lot of people on a very small piece of land. Uh, we also use natural cross currents um, of wind from the hills here, so we don't have acorns. This place I'm sitting in has no acorn, and I don't seem sweaty at all. Um, <laughs> we also have natural light maximization, um, which means that uh, all of the, the windows are indented. So, um, and I'll show you a picture of that in just a second. Here is a picture of, of our campus. As you can see, all of the windows are um, are indented into the wall. So there's a maximum light, but light is all indirect, which means that the temperature in the classrooms is quite low. Um, and we don't need to use a lot of lights to light up the classrooms. Um, another, uh, uh, this on the right hand side is a picture of one of those um, through fairs. So this spot is, it just looks like a hallway but um, you can very easily repurpose the space as we have done quite a few times uh, into a MIDI auditorium um, to house a few hundred students. On the left hand side, you'll see an example of our classrooms as well. As you can see, the, the tables and chairs are all um, not fixed. So it's very easy to move them around. Um, similarly, on our outside uh, building, our, our gardens, we're planning to have it as food producing gardens. And I'm going to hand over to one of our students, um, Lynette, in just a moment. Um, but basically we want, we don't want just beautiful looking gardens. We want beautiful looking gardens that can also produce food uh, because food security is a massive challenge in most African countries. And so um, it's important for us to take our students here so that they can practically see how easy it can be with a little bit of technology and a little bit of capital to really um, uh, do something fantastic and sustainable. Um, then in terms of 
some of the broader projects that we yeah, that we're working on um, at ALU. And I'm not going to go into great detail because this is very similar to what Rose already discussed, but we really want to push the wildlife economy. And um, also on the call, I saw um, uh, Frank Puris, um, who is really a big thinker when it comes to wildlife conservation and rethinking the way that we uh, monetize um, uh, natural resources. And um, ALU is leading in, in many of, of the, that kind of research on the continent as well. Uh, we also plan to do more research projects around the circular economy. We're um, currently working on projects around um, composting systems um, and just testing some of the things that are composted here in Rwanda. Uh, we also want to teach circular economy, of course. And so we have some electives that we want to introduce in our um, curriculum. We're busy designing them. Um, and uh, finally, probably the biggest thing that we want to play in is um, circular economy student ventures. And this comes to the ethos of ALU. We're not really trying to give people degrees, we're trying to educate people. <laughs> and what that means is we want to equip them with skills to make a meaningful difference um, to the world in the future. And the best way that, that we often think this can be achieved is through business. And um, that is why we really push entrepreneurship at ALU. And one way, one a good example of how circular economy businesses are being pushed is um, through this business called Circulate, which is a student-run on-campus farming cooperative that uses regenerative permaculture principles to circulate the cam campus food system. So I'm going to hand over to Lynette, who will take you through what Circulate is. Um, thank you very much, Rudy. Um, like you said, my name is Lynette Munatlala. Um, I'm a final year student um, studying international business and trade at ALU. I'm very deeply passionate about um, economic development, and I so happen to be the CEO of Circulate. Now, as Rudy mentioned, Circulate is a student-led cooperative that aims to contribute towards um, a circular food system at the African Leadership University in a financially sustainable way by using unused land that we have identified within the campus to develop high-quality on-site and organic produce to local customers, such as um, the ventures that are found within the campus and the ALU Rwanda community. And this is done at price parity by using um, regenerative agricultural and economic practices to circulate um, our waste flows. Essentially, um, permaculture principles are used by mixing crops to create mutually benefit plants, um, mutually beneficial plants that produce a harvest um, with wide nutritional value. And since the food is grown and prepared and consumed on campus, there's no transport or packaging waste. And this um, ensures that it feeds directly into um, existing ventures, helping create an affordable um, um, array of healthy food options. Um, as we have been learning throughout the day um, from Renera and Rudy, um, rethinking value chains is really important, especially in agriculture, as it can significantly reduce and in some instances prevent food and waste losses. This is quite critical um, as it directly solves around four um, out of the 17 SDGs, um, specifically SDG 2, 11, 12, and 15. And this is achieved by focusing on the implementation of sustainable food production systems, um, resilient regenerative agriculture to increase productivity and production, as well as building resilient um, ecosystems that can um, adapt to, to climate change. At Circulate, we really believe that um, future policymakers, um, being the students um, and community of ALU, should live in this environment of effective cooperation between business, government, society, and the environment, negotiating all these dynamics that um, we've mentioned um, um, amongst themselves um, for mutual, for their own mutual benefit. Um, this is something that we believe that um, uh, our community should be able to experience um, firsthand in terms of how successful such an economy could be. And um, this is really highly emulated by our income sharing and ways of work model, where all the shareholders are actually workers within the farm and the food system, carrying out like wage tasks that cumulatively contribute to the percentage that each of the shareholders earn from the business profit. Through this model, um, we found a creative way to incentivize the learning, um, learning regenerative agriculture and general circular economy principles beyond the classroom. And this is what we believe that it actually takes to shift mindsets from for some of you know, Africa's current and future business leaders from, and we wish business was done this way to much more of 
This is actually how business is and should be done. So this kind of skills sharing and hands-on approach is a seed that we hope um, will bear fruit and replicate itself across the continent in all 48 countries that are represented at the university um, as Circulate and ALU continue to grow. So um, in conclusion, um, we at Circulate have and ALU have joined the Ellen MacArthur and Marvel Foundations to actually um, join this whole entire movement that individuals and institutions like yourself um, are walking, you know, the circular economy talk. And we hope that um, by us sharing a glimpse of the impact that um, we stand to create and have already created, um, YouTube can, uh, um, can be inspired to contribute to this, to this effort. And in closing, I just want to tell you guys, um, remember, it is a waste to waste waste. So do not waste waste today. I hope you got it. <laughs> Once again, um, my name is Lynette and it has been such a pleasure um, getting to share what we do um, with you guys. That's amazing. Thank you, Lynette. And thank you, Rudy. Um, I can see Erica's waving her hands in excitement there. Um, it was lovely to hear that story and absolutely kind of working with you guys over the next couple of years and building a network, a support network across the continent is going to be a really exciting thing to do. But we didn't want to finish the session without giving you some fun, practical takeaways. And one of the things that uh, ALU do that I think is a really great um, great activity to build into teaching and how you teach the circular economy is something called teachbacks. And so for the next 20 minutes or so, we are going to immerse you in a bit of ALU learning experience. And so I'm going to ask Rudy to tell us what it is that we're going to do. And then we're going to head off into breakout rooms again and hopefully um, collectively learn together. So Rudy. Thanks, Renira. Um, okay, so teachbacks uh, is something that we, we often do and the students absolutely love it. And I'm saying that with sarcasm because sometimes they don't. <laughs> so teachbacks is uh, based on uh, uh, some philosophies that we as ALU educators hold, which is the discovery-led experiential learning. And um, it's basically the flipped classroom. So instead of uh, believing that a lecturer holds all of the knowledge and students don't know and they arrive to kind of download uh, all the knowledge that is in the lecturer's head. We believe that everyone holds some knowledge and we can collaborate together to create and come to a mutual understanding. So we really love teachbacks because what happens is it's very uncomfortable. <laughs> and as you might see today, it is not very fun sometimes, um, but afterwards it is quite fun. Um, what we do is we ask someone who doesn't necessarily know something to teach that thing to the group. And that's what we're doing today. So in your breakout rooms, we're going to ask the youngest person to select a random object that they see around them. Let's say you pick up a flash drive. Um, you pick a random object and then you teach to the other people how this object can become circular, right? And um, yes, it is going to be uncomfortable, but I, I hope that you can understand that this is a collaborative learning activity. So one person is not expected to know everything. You don't need to know everything about how to make a flash drive um, sustainable or circular. Um, instead, it is everyone coming together with ideas. So the youngest person in your breakout room will pick a random object and will start to teach about how this object can become circular. And everyone then should think about what can I add to this conversation? What can I also say um, that can help this conversation be more rich? Um, and in that way, everyone collectively, collaboratively comes to a better understanding of how to make the USB drive more circular. Now, it won't be a USB drive in your case. Um, the youngest person in your breakout room will choose a random thing and teach on that. Okay, before we head into the breakout rooms, um, are there any questions? Is the instruction clear? Yes, Renuka, so. this is trans dis transdisciplinarity, <laughs> yes. Um, that's another very important thing we believe, uh, that everyone kind of has knowledge uh, and not necessarily specific to any field. Multidisciplinarity, yeah. Okay, so let's um, go into those breakout rooms now. I see Freya has created them. See you on the other side. Shot. You're all smiling, that's good. Uh, hopefully that was a really good experience. Um, it's always great to be able to kind of 
share a bit about how to teach the circular economy and uh, hopefully you've taken away a new technique to use um, in, in your teaching or even with groups of, uh, of business partners and, and in different environments. Um, so thank you very much to everybody for joining us today. I'm going to ask Rose and Ash, who were in two of our groups, just to very quickly share back some of the conversation that they had. So Rose, do you want to just tell us what you were talking about in your group and what product you made circular? Yes, uh, actually my group was very, a very interesting one and uh, we looked at two projects, uh, the Esther project and the Raymond project. Uh, so Esther shared uh, our sanitizer bottle and we're talking about how can we keep it in use and uh, it, she started from ha having to use the right material they could be uh, plant-based they could be uh, recyclable and, and, and long-lasting uh, they could be we talked about glass and we discussed about the disadvantages and advantages and by also having our uh, parts that can be easily removed and fixed back and, and, and uh, having a system where we can refill and refilling being cheaper than, uh, yeah. And, uh, and we also talked about uh, the headphones, the, that, that was the Raimond headphones project. And uh, it was from using material. Um, it was very great to see how material and design were driving our discussion all starting from how the materials are extracted and which kind of materials because if you're using uh we use the word crappy uh um plastic if you're using crappy plastic that is very destructive and it will not degrade uh biodegrade or whatever so it becomes so so we're thinking of the headphones having or starting with using the right materials that are not destructive for, uh, from the environment point of view but also having uh it, the, the headphone being easily fixed and uh, repaired, but also we had a discussion about can it be as a, a product as a service, and uh, we were still discussing on that, and the time didn't allow us. But yeah, it was a great discussion uh, with yeah very great people that I've met. Fantastic! That sounds amazing. I'm actually just going to put a link in the chat here to a case study that we have on our website for Gerard Street headphones, which deal with quite a lot of those design issues and in fact have a rental model rather than ownership. Ash, do you want to share with us what you talked about in your room, please? Sure. Uh, so our room was interesting because uh, I had quite a few of my colleagues from ALU uh, mm -hmm. and then we had two external, external guests. Uh, but what we spoke about, so our, our product was Dylan's t-shirt. So he, he didn't have much around, so we went with his t-shirt. And uh, something that interesting that we spoke about where uh, we, we we spoke about multiple factors. So uh, there was there was con there, were, there was a conversation around the ethical sourcing of of, of cotton and how much uh, you know how much energy goes into con in, in the sourcing of cotton and uh, can we make it uh, can we reduce the amount of plastic that might be used uh, into creating let's say the the t-shirt uh, because again uh, the more plastic that we use the more plastic the more microplastics then the world has to deal with. Uh, so eliminating, you know, waste and, and eliminating, let's say, crap plastic, since we're talking about it. Uh, we spoke about uh, the dyes. We spoke about can we, uh, instead of using harmful dyes, look at uh, natural dyes that, you know, that again, that are maybe used as a waste product from vegetables like beetroot or turmeric. Um, so that was that was an interesting conversation as well. I, I don't think I would have ever thought about it. And Dylan mentioned that uh, something interesting that Frank shared uh, was uh, a video that uh, he saw about turning fish skin into clothing. So fish skin to fashion. So that was interesting. And that's happening in, in, in Kenya, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, so we had interesting. Uh, I definitely have my mind open to uh, many interesting concepts that I might not have thought of before. Uh, but but that was that's what we spoke about it in something as simple as a t-shirt. So yeah, that was my group. Fantastic. It sounds like there were some really great conversations. I've popped another two, um, uh, she says enthusiastically. What was that? Yeah, so I've popped another two links in the chat actually about uh, sustainable t-shirts or circular t-shirts, a company that's based here on this tiny island where I live on the Isle of Wight on the south coast of England that deal with um, how to keep cotton um, in the supply chain. So a really interesting thing for you can, you can go and have a look at. Um, 
Thank you so much to everybody for joining us. Thank you, Rudy and Lynette, um, for, for talking to us about ALU's ambitions and your student venture program, and to Rose for co-hosting with me today. I know Rose and Ash have been putting some links to a form in the chat. Please do open it up, fill in your contact details. We can then keep in touch with you um, as we progress our work in Africa. And we really look forward to seeing some or all of you um, at some of our events and hopefully getting you to help um, engage more people in the conversation around that key role that higher education on the continent can play in, in driving a transition to a fully circular economy across Africa. So thank you very much to everybody and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. It's been great seeing you. Thanks for joining us.